All right, let me just. Oh, oh, hey! All right, good morning. You ready, yeah, Christopher? Yeah, I, I, I think I am. <laughs> all right, just, you know, got 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 all that put together. So uh, anyway, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on uh, where you are. Um, I am uh, Christopher Harrison, and I'm Tom Reesing, and uh, we're here to uh, to do uh, developing uh, SharePoint Advanced uh, solution development. And uh, as a, a real quick introduction, uh, first of all, uh, about myself. Uh, again, my name is uh, Christopher. Uh, you'll notice my uh, Twitter handle right up there, at uh, Geek Trainer. I'm uh, head geek at uh, Geek Trainer. I do ASP.NET. I obviously do SharePoint, do SQL Server, Microsoft Certified Trainer. I've uh, been uh, doing uh, training for uh, over 14 years now. Uh, every now and then I'll write a blog post at blog.geektrainer.com. I present uh, quite often at uh, TechEd. Still remember my good old Commodore 64, uh, husband, father of one four-legged child, half border collie, half lab, all personality, um, and, a, uh, and a marathoner. Awesome. Well, you know, I'm really excited to be here with Christopher. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, of course. You know, we have a social module today, we, so yes, we exactly. should we should be leading with our uh, how to at mention us on yes. Twitter because yes. that's a vital skill for at mentioning yes. in SharePoint as well. Exactly. I'm pretty much SharePoint all the time. No, no SQL Server for me. No, yeah. I, actually, I do. Uh, sometimes I'll do a SQL Server for SharePoint uh, for SharePoint admins. Right. Uh, Training, you know, but, but yeah, I, uh, I'm a Microsoft certified master in SharePoint. I uh, I've been doing SharePoint for only SharePoint pretty much for the last seven years. I started recently at Jive Software. I'm learning a lot about uh, the way they do social business software and how they integrate with SharePoint. And and I uh, was awarded an MVP in SharePoint this year, and I hope I can get another one sometime. <laughs> Excellent. Christopher said I, I look young, so maybe you won't believe that I've been doing software development for 17 years, but it really I have. I graduated in 97, and I've written a couple books. I love playing basketball, and I'm very proud of my six-year-old coder. <laughs> I blog sometimes awesome. at TomReasing.com. If you're watching this live and you go there, it's running on SharePoint 2010. Next week, I hope it's running on... Uh, a responsive website. So, <laughs> if you try to browse to it on your mobile site right now, mobile phone, it's not going to look so good. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So let's uh, talk about what we're going to talk about. Uh, so we're going to start off uh, this morning talking about uh, managed metadata, uh, MMS, which is uh, one of the biggest reasons, of course, to make the move into uh, into SharePoint Server. How uh, you can centralize all your different uh, keywords, some of the different uh, additional functionality that that's going to uh, to bring to the table. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, SharePoint Search, really kind of from st almost start to finish. That so we'll talk about how things work behind the scenes. Uh, that for those of you who've been doing uh, SharePoint uh, 2010 in the past now making the move into 2013, uh, what you're going to notice is that it's sort of a combination of what we had with SharePoint Server Search plus Fast, and it seems like just enough has changed just to make things confusing. So we'll get in, we'll take a look at uh, how some of the things have changed behind the scenes, how to uh, control that from a developer standpoint, and then also how to help customize the user experience so that way they can more easily find the items, find the documents that, uh, that they're looking for. Search got so many changes in 2013, we had to give it two modules this time. So Christopher is really going to lead those three. I'm going to start talking about, in the afternoon, uh, I'm going to talk about working with business connectivity services, something I talk about quite a lot, but I'm going to focus on some of the things that have changed in 2013 as opposed to what you might have seen in uh, SharePoint 2010 or with the business data catalog in 2007. Then I'm going to talk about managing and accessing user profile data. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then uh, customizing the social workload, and that's those are those are going to be exciting. We'll finally you can at mention us on Twitter right now, right? But we're not going to yes. talk about social for like seven hours. <laughs> but you can still do it now. You I mean, can still yeah. do it right yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about you. I'm always looking for for, for new followers. Yes. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, now, for those of you who are uh, brand new to uh, to MVA, what you'll notice is uh, that there actually is a, a whole community, kind of keeping with that whole social theme that we've got going on today. Um, you'll notice that there's over a million different uh, registered users, um, and you can get training videos, these types of things. 
on almost any product that you could possibly Amazing. think of that uh, that comes out of Redmond. Even so. Visual Studio 2013, I hear. Yes, yes. So I've so I've heard. So I've heard. Um, yeah, nice little four hour session. So um, uh, again, whoever it was that was that was here in your spot, oh, uh, just the your, other day, your wife had, was had it? more hair. Not quite. <laughs> That's how rumors get started. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but in any event, uh, one of the other things that you can do um, is actually uh, earn points that you'll notice the uh, little URL, and then you'll notice the code expires on, uh, that's going to be January 11th, uh, just to kind of clarify for everybody outside the U.S. Uh, in the social January module, 11th. we call that gamification. Gamification. There you go. Yes, yes. Points, points. right? Yep. That's right. Everybody wants points. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So with that, let's roll on into uh, module one here. Uh, which is uh, developing our managed metadata solution. Now, what we want to start off with is the different moving parts, the different components, and quite frankly, why should you care about managed metadata? Then we'll get in, take a look at uh, setting up the store, how to go in and configure things both through the, uh, through the UI, which I think is still very important for us as developers to know, because that is something we are going to be responsible for quite frequently, is doing things through the UI. Absolutely. If you can't set it up in the UI, you're going to be uh, in a lot of trouble when you try and work with it in the code. Right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you don't understand the UI, how are you going to get in and write code against it? So right. we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll take a look at it in the UI, but we'll also, of course, since this is a, a development course, uh, take a look at uh, how to write code against it. And in particular, my main focus is going to be doing it from the client side. That, of course, one of the biggest shifts in the API from 2010 to 2013 has been the client side got a lot more powerful. There's a lot more that we can do with that. And in particular, one of the big new things is the ability to do things with um, uh, managed metadata. Of course. So we'll see how to do that uh, from the client, both as well, both the administration side of it, how can you create brand new term sets, how can you create terms, but also how can you go retrieve those terms later and actually assign them into, uh, into an item. Awesome. So let's start off by talking a bit about those uh, managed metadata uh, components. Now, when people think of managed metadata, the number one thing that comes to everybody's head is terms. That what we can have inside of managed metadata is that hierarchical, category, uh, hierarchical set of terms that when, I, I'm currently a contractor, but whenever I had full-time jobs, I gotta be honest with you, um, I never knew what my job title was, but there was always a set of, uh, of job titles. And so we wanna be able to centralize those in one location, so that way if I'm going in and I'm creating brand new contacts, I wanna be able to assign the proper, uh, proper job titles. On top of that, I also want to make sure that if there is maybe some form of a hierarchy, that maybe we've got developers, and then we've got our web developers, we've got our UI developers, we've got our database developers, that we can go ahead and classify those, that we can show a hierarchy. And that we also want the ability to show that we do have different aliases, different labels, that uh, you know, sometimes it might be uh, uh, a user interface developer is the full title, but you know, maybe it's just simply a, a UI developer that uh, most people will actually refer to it as. I wanna make sure that I've got that consistency when I'm creating my items inside of SharePoint. And that's the big thing that uh, managed metadata is gonna do for us. Would you call that a synonym? I would call that a synonym. Yes. I would also call that a label, but I would also call that a synonym. You know, something that means the, uh, the exact same uh, thing there. Right. Just, yeah. you know, said slightly differently. Now, uh, one of the other big things that managed metadata is going to do is it's going to bring to the table keywords. That keywords are very free form. That there certainly is a time and a place for structured metadata. That I'm going to require that you give me uh, values for this, this, and this, and that's it. But it's also sometimes nice to be able to tag things, that just because somebody's created an item doesn't necessarily mean that they know every last little bit of metadata that needs to be associated with it. So we want something that's going to be a bit uh, free form, or bring this back into social, which seems to be the theme in the morning. We're very social people over here. Uh, bring this back into social, one of the things that you'll notice if you go in and create your user profile, the things like ask me about, the things like the hobbies, that again, we want people to be able to freeform type anything in, so that way Tom can go in, he can type in basketball, I can go in, I can type in, uh, uh, in running. But we want to still make sure that we've got some level of consistency uh, to kind of help prompt people. Hey, you know what? By the way, somebody else who's typed in BA also said basketball, you know, and kind of show them that, uh, that autocomplete. And that's where our keywords come into play. And keywords is part of managed metadata. 
right along with that whole social aspect is our hashtags. Um, hashtagging, you'll notice that social is everywhere inside of, uh, of SharePoint now. So the ability to put in our hashtags, that way you can click on them, see every single item that's been uh, granted that is uh, very powerful. And again, all of that is built into managed metadata. The last big feature inside of managed metadata is this little thing called a content type hub that content types allow me to have consistent structure to my data. So when I go in and I create, let's say, a deployment document, and that deployment document needs to have things like the PR number, uh, who the developer was that created it, who the QA person was that checked off on it, uh, we need to have all that information. And we might have those deployment documents for SharePoint deployments, SQL deployments, whatever else it uh, might be, just maybe uh, an MVC application. But regardless of where it is, it's always the same type of document. We want that consistency. This is what content types give us. Well, the problem is content types are typically scoped to just that site and everything down below it. I don't get reuse outside of the site collection unless I have a content type hub. Or what I do is I go into Manage Metadata and I say, hey, by the way, do me a favor. Look inside that site collection. Any content types that you find inside of there, push them out to the entire enterprise. So that way I now finally get reuse throughout the entire, not just uh, uh, farm, not just the web application, but to the entire enterprise. So beyond just simply, kicking back to, uh, to the slides here, uh, beyond just simply the ability to store all of those values, you'll notice that uh, managed metadata gives me a lot of additional uh, capabilities that we mentioned the, uh, the user profiles, the ability to have all of those uh, different keywords. And then in particular, and we'll be talking about this a bit more in the next uh, couple of modules, is SharePoint search. Then when we start talking about search, what we want is consistency. So that way when I go in to find a particular item, I type in a, a, a particular word, I know that every single document that's related to that has the exact same word with the exact same spelling, no abbreviations, no nothing. This is where managed metadata is going to come into play. Now, the way that managed metadata is broken down is into this little hierarchy that you see right here, that we've got our term store, we've got our groups, and we've got our term sets. Let's actually break those down. So first up, our term store. A term store is an implementation of managed metadata. So if you go into central administration, you go into your service applications, and you click new managed metadata, type in whatever you want the name to be, choose wherever you want the database to go, and you hit OK, and you wait for whatever it is that's going on behind the scenes to, to happen. That's my little hamster um, wheels. Dance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all the hamster wheels. Right. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're turning really, they're running really, really fast. For a <laughs> SharePoint server, I tell you. <laughs> we really, really put those hamsters to work there. Um, so the, uh, the hamster wheel goes off and it does its thing and, and, and creates the database and sets everything up behind the scenes. What we're going to get once that is done is our term store. Now that term store is going to be a container for our keywords, it's going to be a container for our hashtags, and it's going to be a container for groups, which we'll get to in just a moment here. Now you're also going to notice that at the term store level, I have the ability to, of course, administer and manage that. That there is a term store management tool that's available, which we'll introduce here in uh, just a couple of minutes. But in particular, I get to delegate control. So I can choose that, yes, I'm going to be responsible, but I can also put other people in charge of that term store as well. That going back to the uh, little thing that I mentioned earlier that, you know, had a full-time job, um, I had no idea what my job title was. I, I have a very basic philosophy in life that if it doesn't directly impact me, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to memorize it. So my job title didn't really impact what I did. I knew what my job was. Whatever they called me, well, whatever they called me, that's, that's maybe a different story. But no, whatever they called me as far as the job title goes really doesn't impact me. So it was just something that I didn't bother learning. Well, the HR people, they, of course, know what all the job titles are. So you know what? Let's put them in charge of managing all of that. And that's one of the great things about the service applications in general, but uh, managed metadata in particular is the ability to delegate control. And you'll notice that you could do that at the term store level by going in and making certain people uh, administrators. But also going one step further, you're also going to notice that we've got these groups, which we can also delegate out uh, control to as well. 
Now, groups are going to be our collections of term sets. We'll talk more about term sets here in just a moment. And our term sets, are, or I'm sorry, our groups are perfect for delegation of control. That the problem that we have, just going back one slide here, uh, the problem that we have with the term store is that that's a relatively high level to delegate out because now you have control over all the different groups. So I might have maybe just one term store and inside of there I've got things like maybe our job titles and maybe I also have things about our product information. Well, I don't want to completely give uh, HR control over all of that. I want them in charge of the job titles, but I don't want them in charge of all of the product information that we might have inside of there. And it would be, would it be safe to say we really don't want to delegate authority to the developers for either of those term sets? <laughs> would that, would well, you say that? Yeah, yeah there's, there's certainly a, a, a level of that. Now, yeah. on the other hand, we don't want HR to be in charge of the, uh, the coding Exactly. Keywords, right? In yes. The terms. Yeah. 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 Let's 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 meet skills. Let's 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 take the people that are skilled at this and put them in charge of this. Let's take the people that are skilled at this and put them in charge of that. So yes, yeah. Let's let's separate control there. Because yep. as much as HR, you know, has to hire the developers, do they really know the difference between C Sharp and VB.net? No. <laughs> That's another conversation, though. Um, so you'll notice that at the group level, we can also delegate out control in one of two ways that we can set up uh, managers and we can set up contributors. Where managers are able to modify our terms and choose contributors, contributors are just able to modify terms, not able to choose other contributors. Now, down at the bottom here, this is probably the most important aspect to the entire thing. Managers and contributors do not need access to central administration. That I would say the number one question that I always get asked the moment that I bring all of this up is, wait a minute, does that mean that Steve down in HR needs to have access to central administration? And I can immediately see my administrators just breaking out in a cold sweat. So they're, they're just not interested in that. Steve in HR is not too happy about that either, yeah. I'll tell you, because central administration is <laughs> not a place you really want to go if you're an end user. No, 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 not at all, not at all. And so fortunately, you don't need to, to give them access to central administration, that they can actually just go straight in to their uh, site, just go into site settings, and you'll notice there's a term store administration link right inside of there. Now our groups, as we mentioned, are going to be containers for term sets. And our term sets, and I really think this is the easiest way to think of it, is that they match up to our columns. So when we start talking about SharePoint, we start talking about um, delegating th or uh, setting things up inside of SharePoint, People know that uh, uh, everything is a list. By the way, I'm going to warn you right now, I'm going to say that about a billion times today. Everything's a list. Exactly. Let's That's just get really it out of the way. It. Yeah, exactly. Tell you what, if, um, if you're not already familiar with SharePoint, um, here, I'll make it very easy for you. Everything is a list. Done. A okay. document's a so list. So with that, um, I, I guess we're all set and ready to go. No. Um, <laughs> That's it. We got it covered. <laughs> SharePoint. Everything's a list. Uh, yes, done. Uh, no, but uh, in any event, uh, so you've got your list, you've got your columns, and typically when you go in and you create a column, you say, well, I want this to be strings, or I want this to be uh, numbers. Well, now what you're going to do is you're going to link that back to term sets. Your term sets are going to contain terms. Those are going to be the actual values. And then you'll also notice that our term sets can have certain bits of metadata, things like owners, contacts, and stakeholders. I want you to note that bottom bullet point right there. Let's be very clear about this, because this confused me when I first saw it. I can mark somebody as an owner of a term set. You know what power that gives them? No. What power does it give them? Absolutely nothing. Oh, that's, that's it. Bad. Yep. It's just simply, hey, congratulations, you're an owner. You mm. don't have any power. You don't have any additional responsibility. You're just simply flagged as the owner. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, that can absolutely be something that's worthwhile of knowing. So that way, you know, if uh, there is somebody that uh, that's the real point of contact for the data that's going to be inside of there, it's nice to be able to flag them at that. But the big thing to keep in mind is that just because I make you an owner, just because I make you a stakeholder, does not mean that you have any permissions, that I would need to go back to the group level and make you a contributor or make you a manager. I can see why you'd be confused by that, because I mean, if I own a car, I want to be able to do something with it, like drive it, right? <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> I don't want people life. just to know I'm yeah. the owner of the car. I just right? have it in your driveway, just you know, go out there and wax it periodically. Exactly. All right. 
Um, and then finally, you'll notice that we've got our, uh, our terms. Now, our terms are going to be hierarchical. So again, we could have developers. And then underneath that, we can have all the individual types of developers. You'll notice that we can have our synonyms or our, uh, or our labels. Uh, so that gives us the ability to have our abbreviations. Now, one of the other very big things that we have the ability to do is to set up our different languages. So, you mean everybody doesn't speak English? Believe it or not, no. Oh. Yeah. So we have the ability to go in and set up all of our, uh, our different uh, languages. Now, beyond that, we get a lot of control over how to administer everything inside of, um, inside of our term store. So you'll notice that we have the ability to uh, get a lot of reuse by maybe copying terms, which is just going to create a brand new copy. But you'll also notice that we've got a couple of neat little options here with reusing and pinning. That with reusing, what we can actually do is have the exact same terms appear in multiple locations. So I could actually modify them from anywhere inside the hierarchy, and that would be reflected everywhere. Contrast that with pinning, where what we'll have is the one master copy, if you will. That's going to be the one part that's going to be editable. It can be used in other locations, but it's only editable from the original location. Good to know. That's a big difference. Yeah. It's, it's subtle, but it is. It's very important to, uh, to note there. And then last but not least, uh, down at the very bottom there is uh, deprecation, which doesn't delete the terms. It just simply means that you're not able to apply it to brand new items. Is that like the sandbox model? It's deprecated. I see what you did there. Clever. Clever. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. All right. Yep. That's going to be the humor for the, for, for, for the day. All right. Now, to go in and um, create a uh, managed metadata, uh, you'll notice that you could just go in and create this through uh, central administration. Um, you know, hey, we're developers. You know, let's, let's write the code. And you'll notice that you could also do this through, uh, through PowerShell. PowerShell's uh, great. Uh, I mean, PowerShell's fantastic. Yes. Yeah. So you could also just do everything inside of, uh, of PowerShell. And you know, you it's, right it's a little bit of a bridge between the IT pros and the developers. Yeah. Like we ha can play on the same playground right now. Exactly. Right? Every, everybody come together. We'll all you know, get together sing Kumbaya. All right. So now let's take a look at how to configure managed metadata. So what you're going to notice first up is the term store manager. Now our term store manager is in fact accessible from inside of central administration. But you'll also notice that it's in, uh, accessible from inside of site settings, so that way I don't need to give my users access to that. And it is going to be our UI for managing our term stores. You know, I've been talking an awful lot. Let's, let's go take a look at something. Demo. You know? Yeah. All right. Let's see. Now we're going to see if I can't master PowerPoint, which anybody who is tuned in yesterday knows that that turned out to be a bit of an adventure for well, me. Well, you know, SharePoint <laughs> Advanced Development doesn't really have anything to do with using PowerPoint. Yeah, so, see? you know, you can, be, you can be forgiven for... Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Okay. So here's what I want to um, highlight real quickly here is I've got central administration here. Let me um, uh, window arrow. No, go back. Stay. Good boy. See, I told you I have a dog. Um, and then we'll put that over there. There we go. See, we'll use the snap, snap feature. Snap, yes. Yeah, Windows 7 was my idea. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into uh, Manage Service Applications. And you'll notice right there that I've got my Manage Metadata Service. And I'll go ahead and I'll click on that. And uh, you know what? Let's go in and create a uh, real quick uh, new group here. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hopefully save somebody a little bit of time here. Um, one of the things, of course, that SharePoint offers you is that configure your farm wizard, um, which is nice if you're just looking to set up a real quick dev environment. One of the little quirks about it, however, is it doesn't mark you as an administrator to manage uh, metadata. Yeah. And so you'll go into there and you'll go, all right, well, I want to create a brand new, uh, a brand new uh, group, and you won't see the little arrow there. And the reason is you weren't flagged as an administrator. So just go in, add yourself in as an administrator. And then yeah, that's a go. good tip because wizards... You know, they yeah. seem like magic, right? Yep. I, I seem to infer that there's magic involved, actually. Yeah. Well, right? there it's is. A wizard. It's, it's, it's a wizard. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. But sometimes their tricks don't yes. go so well. No, right? not always. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me go and create a real quick um, uh, new group here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and call this um, uh, SPMBA. There we go. And uh, we'll hit enter. And then you'll notice that from inside of here, I could also go in, create my uh, brand new term set, maybe uh, job titles. And then uh, from here, 
I can start creating my uh, new terms. And what I really like is I could go ahead and say uh, maybe um, uh, human resources. Um, I could say developers. And you'll notice that I just hit enter and it goes right to the next one. I can also go in, uh, create my hierarchy. So maybe um, this will be our uh, UI developer and uh, this will be our MVC developer and our uh, SharePoint developer. So what we see on the screen there, Christopher, is a term store, one yep. term store, yep. a group you just created, yep. and then a, uh, a set of terms underneath the group. And that's exactly it. And a hierarchy. Yep, and a hierarchy. Wow. Now you'll also notice over here, if I choose my little term set, that uh, as promised, I've got things like my owner, my contact, my stakeholders, no permissions there. If I kick back over, you'll notice my SPMVA, and I do have my managers and my contributors. So if there's certain people that I want to flag, I can do that. So I've gone in and I've set that up through central administration. Over here on the uh, left-hand side, this is my little dev site. Let me go in, hit the gear, and go to site settings. And you'll notice that from inside of here, I've got my term store management. Let me go ahead and click on that. We'll get right on that, Rose. There we go. And uh, let me just refresh the, uh, the right side here. There we go. And what you'll notice is that what's on the left, what's on the right, is identical. Because they're both giving me access to the exact same term store. Very nice. So I can do all of that straight through the UI that I don't need to go in and um, uh, necessarily write code. Now, of course I can. I'm going to get into that. But I don't necessarily need to, uh, to write code in order to, uh, to be able to do that. OK. Whoops. By the way, I'm going to minimize my, uh, my remote desktop there. I'll give you a heads up next time. <laughs> OK. Now. This is development. How do we actually then go in and, uh, and create code? Let's see some code. Yes, let's see some code. Now, what you're going to notice is that we do have the ability to do this from both the server side as well as from the client side. Now, if we are going to do it from the server side, what you're going to notice is that we new up this little um, uh, taxonomy session, which will allow us to connect, and we pass in the site collection. Now, one of the things that I really like about the client-side object model, or CSOM, um, is the fact that it's relatively close to the server-side object model. It's so, good to have some parity. Yes, exactly. Some level consistency. of consistency. Yes. yes. Ooh. Yeah, hey, good word. <laughs> so um, what's very nice about that is that if you've learned how to do it in one spot, it makes it that much easier to do inside of another spot. And so you'll notice that it's almost going to be the same API with the CSOM, which I'll get into and uh, demonstrate in, uh, in just a moment here. And then to connect out to our term store, then it's simply term store and then specify the, uh, the particular item. Then if we want to create a group, then what we're going to do is we're going to say create group, specify the name, and a GUID, because after all, everything gets a GUID in SharePoint. Everything gets a GUID. So everything is a list, and everything inside of SharePoint gets a GUID. You know, the, the, the people who thought up SharePoint, they just, I think they really love globally unique identifiers, <laughs> the, the whole idea of it, right? I mean, wow, it's like, it's like magic. It's another yes. wizard. I can, <laughs> I can make a GUID. And nobody yep. will ever have another one that's exactly the same, right? So they use it all over the place. Exactly. I mean. And by the way, if I ever do throw out a TLA uh, and I don't define what it is, let me know. TLA, by the way, is a three-letter acronym. Oh, I was, was going to ask you that. See? All right. So now what you'll also notice is that if I want to go in and set up a uh, term set, I can do that. All that I need to do is just uh, create that and then commit that back into the, uh, into the workspace. And you'll notice it's the exact same thing for creating um, individual terms. Now let's get in and take a look at how to do this from the, uh, from the client side. So let me uh, fire up my demo slide. Here we go. And let's see. Can we master SharePoint? See some Just client side object model. Yep. We're going to be saying that. Uh, it's not a, a three bit. letter acronym, though. That one's got four. That's got four. OK. Yeah. <laughs> And the problem is that, you know, if you say FLA, that just doesn't have the same, <laughs> you know, level of jokes. See, TLA is funny because it's a three-letter acronym and there's three letters, see? It's funny to me. All right. <laughs> Look, most of these jokes are just for my own entertainment. Um, all right. So in any event, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to fire up uh, Visual Studio here. And uh, I'm going to create a brand new project. Now, 
Whenever I'm demoing, we will get in and, and create an app a little bit later on today, but whenever I'm demoing API stuff, I don't know about you, but at least for me, I generally like to just do this with the, the console. And the reason that I like to do this with the console is just because it, it strips everything else out. Um, you know, I don't want to have to worry about a button or to deploy all of this. You know what? Just show me the API and then let's go ahead and, and use it that way. Um, I find a lot of times if I'm creating like a web part to demo this, um, you just wind up losing the forest for the trees. I, I, I see what you're saying. I mean, it yeah. really makes it simple. It yep. makes it straightforward. Focus on what it is you're trying to do, and don't worry so much about the chrome around it, right? Exactly. That could get in the way. Yeah. You know, make it nice and easy. In fact, a lot of times I end up doing some things in PowerShell now because you don't even have to launch Visual Studio. You can just do it straight from the command line. That right there is probably one of the biggest tips that uh, uh, that we could give is one of the great things about PowerShell is exactly that, that you don't need any special tools. You just fire up the ISC and, and away you go. So if you're really just trying to explore and kind of poke around inside the API, PowerShell can be a great spot to, to go in and play especially around. Especially with uh, the latest version of PowerShell, you actually do get some uh, help, a, a little bit more help, a little uh, code completion there, yep. similar yeah. to Visual Studio. Yeah, it's actually, it's pretty slick. It's pretty slick. Okay, so let me go in, uh, create my uh, little app here. And by the way, um, just as a real quick aside, um, if you do want access to, um, uh, to the code here, uh, all you have to do is just, um, uh, again, uh, send via Twitter, and uh, I'll just type it out on the screen, um, at uh, Geek Trainer, um, and I'll go ahead and uh, make that available. So just uh, tweet me, and I will be more than happy to, uh, to make that uh, I like how you available. did that. Thank you. I might have to follow. See? Yeah. OK. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, real quick, uh, right click and oops, let's right click on the right spot here. Right click, add reference, chugga, chugga, chugga. And what you're going to notice is I've already got under my, come here, uh, under my recent uh, section here, um, a whole set of DLLs that I've already used. Uh, you'll notice that they're all available under the uh, Microsoft Shared 15 Hive. So you can go off and go get them. Uh, and what I want to highlight here is the two client and client runtime. Now, if you've done uh, SharePoint uh, 2010, those two are very familiar to you. But if you go into that ISAPI directory and you start looking at the client DLLs, you're going to notice that there's a lot of brand new client DLLs that are available to you. In particular, for, for our purposes, you'll notice that there's a taxonomy. DLL that's available now that we can then use for connecting up to and working with uh, with MMS. It's almost as if uh, SharePoint 2010's client side object model was like SharePoint client side object model version 1.0, right? Exactly. For version yep. two with 2013 is much richer. Exactly. Yeah, that you can do so much more now with the uh, with the client object model in 2013. Okay. So what I'm going to do um, is uh, set that up and let's go ahead and say uh, using. And I'm going to say new and, oops, I should probably um, var um, context. There we go, equals new and uh, client context. By the way, um, just a real quick little Visual Studio chip, trick. Um, if you don't have the using spot, what you can do is just control dot. And then you'll notice it'll bring up the auto fix there. And then hit enter. And it will automatically throw the using statement up towards the uh, Control top. Control dot. There. Control dot. Wow. I hadn't heard that one before. Uh, SP 2013 like dev. There we go. And let's get to the outside of that. And cool. All right. And before I forget, because I always forget this, let me set my credentials. Um, system net um, credential cache and my default credentials. OK. So first things first, uh, I need to set up my uh, little session. So we'll go ahead and say uh, var session uh, equals new taxon. Actually, not new. I want um, taxonomy session. There we go. And get default or get taxonomy session for my context. There we go. And just to make sure that everything's up to date, I'm just going to do a real quick uh, update cache there. So now we've got the session that, that connected us out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and grab our term store. So we'll say var uh, store equals, uh, and we'll say session, and this is my get default site collection term store. So just That's simply, a big one. Yeah, wherever we Mouthful. happen to be, go grab it. Now what's really nice, what this is going to do for us, and let me 
Um, update cache here again real quick. It's like, thank God for autocomplete on that one. Yeah, right? no kidding. <laughs> now, what's what's happening there, what this is doing is it's calling out for the term store for this particular site collection. One of the things that can happen is you might have in your farm two or three or four um, MMS implementations. Chances are you don't. Chances are you just have the one, but it is possible that you might have two or three or four. Well, when you go in and you create a context, you're really only ever interested in things that are around that context. I, I, I don't care about the other two or three MMS implementations that aren't associated with this web application or this site collection. So just go get me the one for this site collection. And that's what that little method it's right there will do. It's a very descriptive method name. It know. is. Yeah, very helpful. So it's, it's long, but it's, it's quite nice. All right. So now let me go in and get the uh, collection of term groups. So we'll say term group collection uh, groups. Uh, and term store, oops, I called it store, and we'll go ahead and grab our uh, groups, and then I'm going to say term group equals, and I'm just sort of changing apparently. I was doing var all the way up at the top, and then for whatever reason, my brain just decided, and it's just going to kill me. I'm a, I'm a developer. I need that consistency. Wow. So I'm just, yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yep. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, create a real quick group here. And so I'm going to say store and uh, create group. And I'm going to go ahead and call this, um, let's say, CSOM, um, just to show that we did, in fact, uh, create that from there. And I'm going to need to give it a uh, GUID. So we'll just say GUID and new GUID. There we go. By the way, I'm, I, again, I'm a developer. I just want to be able to pronounce everything. So not a UID. It's, yeah, GUID. GUID, why not? Yep. And you know, I think using var everywhere gives you more consistency with the uh, JavaScript client-side object model. Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. And that is, you know, bring it back ag again. You'll notice that I'm doing this in, in C Sharp. And frankly, the reason that I'm doing this in C Sharp is just because the IntelliSense is more powerful in C Sharp than, than JavaScript. It just is. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But We love Visual Studio. We do. I, and yeah. I love Visual Studio, and I love JavaScript. And we're not blaming Visual Studio for that. Um, it's just, it, it simply is what it is. So when I'm doing demos, um, it's definitely nice to have the appropriate level of, uh, of IntelliSense here. Makes, uh, makes life a lot easier. You don't have to spell out get default site collection term <laughs> store, right? Exactly. <laughs> okay. So let me go in and uh, I'm going to create a real quick uh, term set here. So I'm going to call this uh, locations and we'll say group um, create um, group. There we go. And we'll go ahead and say uh, create term set. Again, it's going to want a name. Let's go ahead and say uh, locations. It's going to want a uh, GUID, GUID, new GUID. And it's going to want a locale ID. And uh, I'm going to do 1033. Um, 1033, for those of you not, for, that are not familiar, is for what Mark Manassi calls defaultia, which is US English. Of course. Um, that's why you see. Everyone knows that. 1033. <laughs> 1033. Right? Just well, like GUID. You know, I, I went for a long time and, and actually didn't know that. <laughs> it's a magic number. Three is a magic number. Um, <laughs> it is. I'm going to let that one go. <laughs> um, Seattle. A little schoolhouse rock for the morning, um, 1033, and, or afternoon or evening, um, new GUID. Wherever you are. Exactly. And, not everyone's uh, in defaultia. Not everyone is in defaultia. And even if you are in defaultia, it's not necessarily morning. Um, let's go ahead and say uh, San Diego, and let's go ahead and say uh, San Antonio. Let's give, oh, yes. The, there, yes. There we go. Let's give San Antonio yep. some love. And there you have it. So what you'll notice, and I really didn't need my uh, groups here, so let me just clean up my code because otherwise it's going to bug me. So you'll notice that there is all of the, um, uh, all the different terms. I'm going to go ahead and execute uh, that little query. So we'll just uh, context and execute query. Perfect. And then let's just do a real quick console, uh, right line, and we'll say uh, created um, our uh, group and set and terms. And whenever I see that console write line, I'm ready for the next line to be console.read line, right? <laughs> well, I, I'm just going to control F5. OK. So, All right. Yeah. Yeah. Then the, the, the command prompt won't. So I love that you put San Antonio in there, because you know Will I Am's a programmer now. I think maybe Tim Duncan might be, too. Well, there you go. OK. So let me just um, uh, update this real quick. And again, I've never done this before. 
There you go. So you'll notice it tells me it created the group and, uh, and the terms. And if I come on back to my term store here. Now are you in central admin in the term store or yeah, I mean, are you in site settings in the term store? And here's what's great. It doesn't matter. Wow. I could be in either spot. It's like and magic. It is. And so now you'll notice that there is my, uh, my CSUN that I created. There's my locations. There's San Antonio, San Diego, and Seattle. So when you get right down to it, the code is relatively straightforward here. If I just clean this up uh, a little bit here. There we go. Kind of just put in a couple little more little items, uh, a little more character turns to make it a little bit more readable. It's very straightforward. Then all that I'm doing is I'm uh, getting a taxonomy session, making that initial connection, saying, hey, I want the term store. I'm going to create a group. I'm going to create a term set. I'm going to create my terms. And then just like always, whenever you're doing CSOM, you just simply execute query to send all that back. Cool. Beautiful. It's just like you did it in the, in the user interface, but it's in code. Exactly. Very intuitive. All right. Let me um, uh, real quick just extract that out, and I'm going to say create term uh, set, and real quick comment that. OK, cool. So now let's get back to my slides here. I love how Visual Studio has refactoring now. I mean, yes. you know, I have been doing this for 17 years. Yes. <laughs> we okay. didn't have that. When, when did we add that? I don't know. Five or six years ago? Or? The refactoring support? It was 2005. 2000? Yeah. Wow. 2005. Yeah, all right. I'm going back. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Before yep. we had refactoring. Exactly. Like okay. So now let's take a look at how to actually work with those values. Now, when it comes to working with them, of course, we want to be able to read the values. We want to be able to write those values out. Uh, values out. Cool. Now, in order to read the value, that's actually relatively straightforward. That all that you need to do is, just like normal, just go retrieve the list item. You're going to grab the particular field that you want and cast that to a slightly different object here. And that's going to be the taxonomy field value. That's where you're going to cast that to. And then all you have to do is then just go grab the label. And the label will automatically come back with the label based on your particular locale. So I don't even need to do that. Now, when it comes to writing values, things are going to get a little bit more interesting. That the first thing that we need to do is we need to go get the term that we want from the term store. Now, if we've got the GUID, that's easy. If we don't have the GUID, it becomes a little bit more of a challenge. And we all know we're carrying GUIDs around with us. Absolutely, we go, I, I, right? I, 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 I have them all in my here. Let me pull it right out. See, right there. It, it, nobody carries them around. No, no. So you know, we have to go get it. Exactly, you have to go get it, and that does take a few methods to to go grab, as we're going to see in uh, in just a moment here. Um, and then we can go ahead and create the taxonomy field value, and then finally assign that out. And let's do exactly that. Let's go ahead and take a look at how all of that is going to uh, to work. So we're going to go to more code, more code, more Visual Studio, more code. All right, all right. Let's see, and I want to go, and I want. Uh, let me guess, console application. Um, yes, in fact, I'm just going to keep using C -sharp. the uh, the exact same, same one. one. Of yep. course, consistency. Yes, organization and consistency will set you free. Okay, I'm, I'm taking notes for my demo. Excellent. So let me do this first. Uh, let me, real quick, go in and um, uh, add an app. And I'm just going to create a custom list. Lists are now apps. Yes, they're still lists. Um, and let me go ahead and say offices and uh, hit create. And uh, there's my offices. And let me go to list. And I'm just kind of cruising through this because I'm not doing anything that a normal SharePoint person hasn't done billions of times, which is go in, create a list, add in a brand new column here. I'm sort of making the assumption that, that, that people have done that um, in the past here. So let's go ahead. We are in the and, advanced uh, developer location. solutions course right now. Exactly. So. Yeah. So you know, there is some level of, of assumption there that, uh, that you've done this. OK. There's my uh, location spelled correctly. Good, good, good. And hit OK. All right. Now, what you're going to notice, uh, first of all, is I can go ahead and uh, create a brand new item. And uh, I could call this, for example, uh, Geek Trainer. 
And uh, I can go ahead and specify a location of, uh, and I, I love this. Look Gives at me, that. Yeah, autocomplete right there. Suggestions. Yep. Let's go ahead and grab our, our San Diego. And, uh, I think that's it. one of my favorite things about managed metadata, actually. Yeah. Well, and, you know, not to, to belabor the point too much here, but one of the biggest things that you want to do whenever you're designing um, your data structure for your users is really try and take as many options away from them as possible. Um, because if you give them text fields, who knows what they're going to type in. So anything that I can do to constrict what it is that they're able to provide is going to help me out in the long run. I, for one, can never remember how to spell Mississippi. My SSI, SSI, PPI. We should have all learned that by See? now. Yeah. You know, it's... Um, Autocomplete is taking my memory away. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> all right. I don't have to remember that anymore. See? Autocomplete is there with management. Exactly. All right. If we have that term store, of course. Yes, if we have the term store. Okay. Um, let me um, sort of uh, cheat uh, just a little bit here. Um, and we always need the context. Yep. Yeah. So I'm just going to go uh, grab the context and uh, and set all of that up. Now, here's what I want to do. Um, the eventual goal here, and in fact, let me just extract this out into a uh, method, um, which you know, I should leave that in there, um, Casey. And um, let me extract this out just so I can put a title on this. Um, what this is going to do, refactor um, extract method, is this is going to retrieve um, an MMS value and assign um, it to a list value. Very descriptive method name. Yes. That's, well, that's what you really want at the end yes. of the day. You know? Okay. So that's what we're going to do. So step one is to then um, go uh, get the uh, term set. That's step one. So we need to go grab that term set. So what we need to do is we need to, again, get our taxonomy session. So let's say var session equals taxonomy session. And let's go ahead and say um, get with our context. And let's go ahead and grab the uh, store. And let's go ahead and say session and uh, get uh, default in our store. All right. So then again, we have that we have that hierarchy: the term store, the term set, yep. the group, and the term. Exactly. Yep. So we're at the store now. We want to step down and go grab the uh, grab the group. But one of the nice things that we can actually do here is once we connect to the store, is I can actually go ahead and grab a collection of term sets just by doing a real quick search. So what I can actually do is say store and then say uh, get and my term sets by name. By the way, if you just simply said term set, you'll notice that it's looking for the GUID. Again, if you've got the GUID, it does make your life easier, but you don't always have it. So what I want is to go grab this by name, and we'll go ahead and say locations and 1033. Now, here's the little problem is we're searching throughout the entire store here. And remember that that store, just as Tom mentioned, can have multiple groups. Those groups can have our different term sets. So it is possible that we might have multiple sets with the exact same name. Oh. So you'll notice that it's going to give it back to us as a collection. So there's the collection. Now, remember we're doing CSOM here. And one of the biggest things about doing CSOM is it's going to use web services. And whenever you're doing web services, it's all about being chunky, not chatty. Yes, Ooh, that is I the saw that in yes. your core solutions yes. MVA course. See? Yeah. Yes. Chunky, not chatty. Right. I, I already learned that. That's yes. great. And I, I love that. And, and by the way, thank you for the little plug there. Yes, of course. Um, so, but, well, um, you know, everything we're doing here in the advanced solutions really depends on core solutions. Yeah, but you do need to have done the core solution. You do need to have played around and, and actually done you know, a couple of apps, done the CSOM, and, and played around. Absolutely. So because of the fact that we want our calls to be chunky, not chatty, send everything up in one shot, we need to have control over when things are going to go up. So before I can actually use this value, before I can actually say var, and let's say location set equals sets and zero, which by the way, I'm cheating a little bit here. 
I know I can do that because I know that that's the only one that's in there. Um, if you were going to be doing this on your own, you'd probably have to loop through and make sure that you found the right one. But before I can do this, and let me just slide that up a little bit, make it a little bit more readable, uh, must um, connect to the server and retrieve the term sets first. Of course. That must happen. Chunky. Yep, chunky. So I need to do that, and that's where my context and my execute query comes into play. Okay, so that's step one. So step one is to go get that term set. All right. Now step two is I need to go get the specific term that we want. And again, this takes a little bit of work that I'm going to need to go in and do a search here to go find the value that I'm looking for. And the way that I'm going to do my search is by setting up a label match information object. Mouthful. So I'm going to say, yeah, that's a mouthful. Uh, match info equals new label match information. And pass in my context. Oops. There we go. Put that to the outside. And on my match info, and by the way, match has a C in it today, um, match, but only today, uh, my LCID is going to be 1033. Uh, um, the label that I want, um, LCID, uh, and let's go ahead and say Seattle, um, and uh, my trim unavailable, uh, match, uh, I apparently just want to do math this morning, uh, trim unavailable. And let's just set that to true. Okay. Oops. I don't know why I said LCID. Uh, label. There we go. All right. So that's the first little step, is that what I need to do is say, okay, well, this is now how I want to do my search. Then what I can do is I can say term collection or var terms equals location set get terms and pass in that match info that I've got there. There we go. And now I can actually go get the data. But again, must go get the data before I can use the term. Here's the little problem that I'm going to run into here is what I need is the LCID which makes sense. And I also need the name and all the labels. Now, whenever we're talking about connecting out to uh, the client object model, whenever we're talking about the client object model, what's going to happen is that basic properties like strings and integers and so forth will automatically be downloaded. Anything complex, however, is not automatically going to be downloaded. So if I want anything complex, which by the way, the labels are going to be complex because this is a collection, I need to specifically tell the context, hey, when you make the round trip, get me that data as well. It's the payload. Yes, exactly. So what I need to do here is I need to go ahead and say context load and then let's go ahead and specify my terms and then tell it, okay, well, when you go grab the terms, and we'll just do this with a uh, Lambda statement, I'm going to say include, and I want to include for each term the labels. There we go. I want the uh, name, and I want the ID. Defalsia. Yes. Oops. Let's make sure... ID. Oops. T. And just waiting for my red squigglies to go away. What did I miss? TS. TS include. T labels. Is there a using statement? T name. U using statement at the top, maybe? Uh, System dot link, maybe? That should actually already be there. Yeah, I've got oh, my system like, right. yeah, give me one second here. I've got, you know, I'm just going to do this. Um, it's actually just going to make my life easier. Uh, TS. T 
TS include and T, T labels, T, T uh, name, and T, and T, and the ID. No red squigglies. I like it. Much better. Okay. And, and you know, one of the things about lambda statements um, is I find so frequently, especially on something like this, where I've got so many different moving parts, sometimes it's just easier just to delete it, recreate it, and then let's go back at it. And obviously that, uh, that worked here. Okay, so now I'm ready to go ahead and uh, execute my query here. There we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now I can go ahead and grab uh, my term. And again, I'm going to uh, cheat just a little bit here because I know that there's only one in there with, with Seattle. I, and again, I'm, I'm taking a couple of little liberties here, but not for nothing, guys. Um, we've got a fair amount of code just to get to here. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm willing to bet everybody's willing to forgive me a couple little shortcuts sure, here. Sure, absolutely. You know? So, so yeah, so now we've got, uh, we've got all of that. All right. Now, last thing. Now that we've actually got the term... Now what I need to do is create the taxonomy field value. So we'll go ahead and say uh, var uh, field value equals uh, new taxonomy field value. Let's go ahead and say field value and set my uh, label to be my term uh, labels zero to string, which is just going to grab me the default label there, which is perfect. My field value, the uh, GUID, is going to be my term uh, ID to string. I have to actually convert that to a string. Um, term GUID here, you'll notice looking for it as a string rather than as a GUID. That's all right. Not a big deal. And then finally, last but not least, is um, a little... Um, uh, field value, little thing called a WSS ID, um, and this just needs to be set to negative one. That's it. Just one of those little things that uh, that needs to be done. Magic number again. Whew. Okay, so there is all of that. So the basic steps here: go get the term set, go do the retrieving, go get the particular term, and 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 again do the round trip back to the server. And then once we find that term, and I'm just going to reorganize my code a bit here. Um, once we find the term, now we can actually create the field value. Fortunately, from here, everything becomes sort of typical CSOM code. So from here, all that I need to do is uh, declare my list. So we'll say list um, of our uh, list, and let's say context uh, web lists get by um, title, and we called it uh, offices. And let's go ahead and say um, list item. I will just do it like that. Var item um, equals list add item new list creation information. And let's go ahead and set our item. Let's set the title to be uh, Microsoft. And whoops, how about you do it like this, Christopher? Um, title equals. Microsoft. That looks a little bit better. There you mean you go. don't have a column named Microsoft? You know, I didn't. Um, I, um, and then um, my uh, location. And let's go ahead and set this to be that uh, field value that we created. Field value. And let's go ahead and say new item, uh, item update. And let's say context and execute query. OK. So just to uh, throw a comment up at the very top here, uh, what we're actually going to do is now create uh, the uh, list item. And what I want to highlight about this is just simply the fact that assigning the field value once we retrieve it is same as it ever was. And I just have a typo there. Item, creation information. There we go. Yeah, there's, it was very... There were quite a lot of steps to get to this point, yeah. but this is very powerful what we're doing here. Exactly. What's nice about this, this is one of those things where, uh, yes, 
Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of code here, but it's it, when you get right down to it, it is gonna wind up being boilerplate code. So this is something where I could extract a method out of this and just accept maybe the label as a, uh, as a parameter, go off, do the search, get the item, and, and away we go. So I mean, yes, it's a lot, but this can eventually become boilerplate code. Okay, the last little thing that, uh, that I wanna do here, um, just to, uh, to print all of this out, is let's go ahead and um, let's just display the contents of the uh, list and let's go ahead and do a uh, list um, whoops, of our offices equals and uh, list get items and I'm just gonna grab everything new, um, camel query. By the way, don't ever do that um, on a production system because that's gonna go get every single item. Um, that might cause a couple of performance issues. So Especially with a long, a, a, a large list. I exactly, exactly. In this case, I think you're okay. You've got yeah, one I've got, item I've, in the I've, list. Yeah, yeah. Two, well, two. I, it'll be two by the time that I'm done. Yeah, I, I, I think we'll be good. Um, and then we'll go ahead and say uh, context and uh, execute query. Um, and then we'll say for each um, uh, list item office in offices. And let's, oh, there we go. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say var uh, location equals and taxonomy field value, my item location, capital L, and then we'll say console right line and curly zero curly is in curly one curly. And let's go ahead and say item and our title. And we'll say our location. And then you'll notice off of our location that I can just go grab the label, just like that. Okay, cool. Whew. I'm just giving everything a once over I think I've got everything. It's a masterpiece. Well, thank you. Thank you. Just making sure I think everything looks good. It's almost that moment where you hit F5. And, and we're going to find out what happens. All right, cool. The anticipation. You know, it's just after writing all that code, you just, you get nervous. There's a lot of lead up. Um, collection has not been initialized. I always love live debugging. On uh, line 31. You learn a lot this way. Um, go, uh, 31. Oh, I know why. I need context load. Ah, the payload. We must tell the client side object model. To actually go get it. Yes. Yep. Um, Sets are complex. I believe that. There we go. Okay, take two. Line 63, okay, we're getting there. That's much further down. Oh, and once again, I just forgot Payload. to tell it to load. Okay, context and Consistency. Yeah, something. you know, offices. Okay. I, um, I think, I always think you know a, a little bit of live debugging is very helpful for the <laughs> audience, actually. There you go. Because, now honestly, I'm going to make the same mistake when I go back and do it. <laughs> and I can remember it even better because of your example, I think. Well, thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Okay. Um, in any event, now, there you go. So now it tells us uh, Microsoft is, uh, is in Seattle. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, what you're also going to notice uh, back over here, uh, do my refresh. Um, I'm curious as to why I got... Three Microsofts there. Um, you did run it successfully. I did run it successfully. The, the first 63 lines, I think you ran successfully the second time. And not the, and the third time, right? Yeah. It got all the way through line no. 15 the first time, and then all the way li through line 63 the second time. Yep. So, uh, but in any event, so the, the, the real takeaway, honestly, that I want you to get out of this, and, and I'll just have to go back and take a look as to uh, what's going sideways on it, but... Um, the real takeaway that I want you to get out of all of this is the fact that I've got Microsoft and Microsoft uh, that were both created there 
through the API. And you'll also notice that if I go in and I edit this item, that it is in fact that Seattle MMS term. That's right. So it magic. did take quite a bit to uh, to get there, um, but it is now possible, or it is possible uh, through uh, through CSOM to be able to connect out and go retrieve values. And again, at Geek Trainer, more than happy to uh, to share that code out with you. Don't worry if you're watching this at home. There's not going to be a quiz on this later. Well, your boss might give you a quiz on this later. Maybe. All right. It's powerful stuff. Yes. So with that. There is how to work inside of uh, CSOM, how to work with, uh, with MMS. Uh, what do you say we take a 10-minute uh, break, um, fix my hair again, um, fix your hair, and then we'll, uh, we'll come on back and we'll take a look at the first module of, uh, of search. We'll see you guys back here in 10.